All right, you're watching Interchain FM, a podcast about all things DeFi, interop, and NFTs. Today we're here with Jonathan Karras. Is that how you pronounce your name? Of yep. Livana Protocol. Livana is a uh, options. Is it uh, an options protocol on Juno Network? And you guys. Uh, so we 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 produce a so Livana is an acronym which stands for leverage any asset. And it's, um, so we have two different uh, leverage products. So one of them is uh, options and then the other is perpetual swaps. And so the, the, those in traditional finance options and perpetuals really work very well together. In, in traditional finance, um, it's called, uh, it's usually called future contracts. And so one of the ways that um, there is uh, real yield uh, or true yield that's generated within the, you know, on Wall Street is through creating uh, delta neutral and market neutral strategies by combining future contracts with options. And so these really play well together and we're very excited. We're very bullish on Cosmos in general um, and on, on Juno and, um, and some various other app chains within the Cosmos ecosystem. And so we're excited to be able to bring both of these primitives um, which we anticipate will have uh, also additional structured products built on top of them, which are some more advanced, like automated trading tools. And happy to break all that down. Got it. So, okay. Do you mind uh, turning off or uh, silencing everything that beeps as well? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. My, uh, my, my internet is, is choppy as expected. So, yeah, <laughs> that, that's where, all. Where, where where are you based, or where are you right now? I'm in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, in uh, so uh, oh, that's interesting. I'll actually I'll be in Miami, um, in about a month. Okay. It's, uh, for yeah, for a, a some conference or something. So it's yeah, it's uh, I really enjoy Florida. Yeah. So, okay, let, let's pick up where we left off and hope my internet um, works well. Um, so, okay, and, and you guys also have your NFT project, right? It's called Dragon's, Dragon, is it Dragon Finance? Dragon's Breath? <laughs> uh, so, so, okay, so Lavana, um, we, uh, part of the way that uh, we came to market um, about a year ago on Terra was through the creation of a sci-fi fantasy story, which is called the Lavana Lore, and we um, we launched the largest uh, NFT collection on Terra. So we had the most amount of users, the largest amount of trading volume, and we actually launched eight um, uh, like play to earn uh, GameFi uh, mini games um, on Terra. Uh, subsequently, since uh, Terra crashed and we migrated to um, to Juno, uh, we we did bring a couple of those games over, uh, and a large amount of our of the collection of our NFTs. So we have this rich fantasy world, which is really an analogy for crypto as a whole. So the um, the the dragons, you know, it's, it takes place about four or five hundred years in the future. The the dragons, um, it's uh, represent like crypto, and it's this. Uh, there's this like evil council that is controlling the last of humanity that lives on Mars. And uh, one day, this meteor shower happens, and and these meteors crack open, and they have dragon eggs in them. And it's it represents kind of this like power and this great equalizer that anybody could just like really just pick up, you know, on the ground. Um, and the council views it as like just like worthless dust, you know, which is like how a lot of times they view like cryptocurrency in general. Um, but actually found within it is um, is the egg of this like impetus of, of growth, um, which is what we're trying to build here, which is a great equalizer and something that can't be controlled. So we actually wrote a full novel. It's like, you know, it's like 300 pages um, of the story of Levana. Uh, the first 10 chapters are an audio book, which you can find on our Discord. Um, and we, you know, we created a, um, a bunch of uh, comics around it. And so there's this, uh, there's this big part of our project, which is focused on uh, beautiful artwork and, and approachable narratives, which, um, you know, can help educate on the value drivers of crypto to a general audience. Understood. And is this sort of self-distributed, like you explained, or are you actually going to publish it in traditional space? 
Like uh, so we'd like to, uh, uh, we actually uh, submitted it to Image Comics. Um, to, so we'll see if they want to publish it, uh, you know, in the, in, you know, in, in the traditional space. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, you know, I'd love to see a, uh, uh, I'm a big comic book nerd and I think it's a, it's a great way to get kids interested into a subject um, is through comics and animation. So, and gaming. So I would love to see um a traditional media that focuses on the narrative of the value drivers of uh, crypto um, really just like penetrate into into the youth space um, beyond the reach of of what you really can get um, you know in like just kind of like t you know memeing on crypto Twitter or TikTok today. Okay, I'm sorry, my my internet uh, cut out for like the last few seconds so i only got bits and pieces of that oh my gosh sure no problem i'm happy to say it again so uh yeah absolutely we're really excited to be able to publish within the traditional space uh we think that uh education is critical to the adoption of crypto and especially education focused on a younger generation and so through storytelling and through gamification it's a, a great way to make uh, something that's complicated like advanced financial products more approachable to a general audience and so ultimately you know my what i'd love is uh you know like a three volume graphic novel with beautiful artwork like published by you know image comics or marvel and uh you know a netflix or amazon prime uh you know mini series that's really interesting if you get it through marvel it might just be one of the first original series that they've gotten in decades uh yes well image comics is much more um you know likely or even like uh like you know Di dynamo or dynamite um you know, there's all kinds of like uh, alternative, um, you know, co like comic book publishers that focus on uh, independent or novel um, narratives. And, you know, the, the idea of kind of like the mashup of like a sign, you know, dragons on Mars, um, we think is a, is a very interesting um, uh, but approachable uh, kind of mashup between science fiction and fantasy that just might work. Got it. And... I just want to go back to the topic of your primary product, sure. which is the options and, and perpetuals. So let's just start with the basics. Um, can we talk about how they work at a fundamental level? Um, options, puts, calls, and, and uh, perpetuals, and then we'll move on to what your product actually does. Sure. So... If you're not familiar with options, um, it's probably one of the most advanced, um, uh, pr you know, financial tools that are in the space. And that's one of the reasons why it's a later stage project um, in terms of the evolution of DeFi. So options um, are where you are. There's there's always a buyer and a seller and the buyer is purchasing the right but not obligation to either sell an asset or buy an asset at a future date. And there's two use cases that I think are um, analogies that make it uh, very um, easy to, for people to understand. So you can, um, you can buy a put, which you can think of as almost like an insurance product. A put means it's the right to sell an asset at a future date at a fixed price. And so how does, um, and you, and you, you pay money for this, this option. Um, it has an expiration. It's good up into a certain date. So why is this like insurance? Well, imagine that you had a car and you were driving your car and you were afraid that your car might get wrecked. It might get, you know, it might fall off a cliff, just like how a token could get wrecked and a token could fall off a cliff. Um, you know, you know, metaphorically speaking in terms of the price. So, um, with your car, if you were afraid that your car could get wrecked and fall off a cliff, so then you might purchase insurance. And so that insurance would say, you know, 30 days from now, you can bring your car to the insurance company. It doesn't matter if it's on fire. It doesn't matter if it's broken up into tiny little pieces. Um, but you can bring the car to the insurance company and they will promise to buy it from you for $40,000. And then based on various market conditions, the price of that insurance package will fluctuate. 
Um, and so that is something that everybody gets on their cars. We pay monthly fees in order to have um, the coverage and the coverage can have, um, you know, the, the coverage they might cover you, you know, with a certain premium and the, the lower your premium is, the higher the insurance package is going to be. Um, so that's why a put options, when you buy them, they will have different premiums associated with them. Those are the, the strike prices. And so, uh, and they'll have a different amount of coverage. Or I mean, I guess the coverage is really a, a better metaphor for the strike price. But so if you want to be covered for, you know, $40,000 worth of damage, that's going to have one price. If you want $100,000 worth of damage, that's going to be another price. And the free market will determine um, how, you know, what you want um, in terms of ensuring, you know, the, the future price of your tokens. Now, the other side is the calls. So calls can be looked at as... Um, as like, uh, I'm going to date myself here, but uh, there was a very popular toy around the holiday season called uh, Tickle Me Elmo. You, you familiar with this? It was, uh, you know, it was a really hot item and it was completely out of stock. So people were like crazy, um, uh, you know, trying to find like, I think that the original thing went for like 80 bucks, but people were selling it for like 500 bucks on eBay. So this like thing went to the moon. So if you just saw uh, Tickle Me Elmo, uh, if your friend bought it, then you might say to them, you know what? I want to buy a right, not an obligation, but an option to purchase your Tickle Me Elmo on December 24th for 200 bucks. And I'll give you, let's say, 20 bucks right now to, to, to buy the rights to be able to purchase it at a fixed rate of $200 Christmas Eve. So now if you now you watch on eBay what the going rates and if Tickle Me Elmo goes to the moon and people are buying that for 500 bucks because they promised their kid this particular um, this particular gift. So then now your call option is in the money. So you go and you execute it and you go to your friend and you say, hey, man, I want this. Uh, I, here's the 200 bucks, like what we agreed to. And then now you just put it up on eBay and you flip it for the 500 bucks and you made 300 bucks profit. So that's that's really what a call option is. So it's the right to buy an asset in the future at a certain strike price, but again, not the obligation. So between these two products, it, the you know you get you really get great ways to hedge. If you think that a product is going to go up, if you think that an asset is going to go up, but you don't have the money for it today, so then you might buy a call. If you think that it, it could go down or you want insurance against it going down, then you would buy a put against it. And so because you don't actually need, uh, because the price of these options is pennies to the dollar, and because the price fluctuates and there can be a secondary market for the options themselves, so then the options really can turn anybody into a whale. Um, you know, and that's that's one of the beautiful aspects of it. And so it's a it's a very advanced financial product that you can actually build structure products on top of it to like, for example, if um, if there's liquid staking tokens. So with the liquid staking token, you might get, you know, like uh, I think you get eight percent interest monthly on staking Juno. That's pretty high. Eight percent. Now, imagine that you could package some of those uh, those Juno tokens into a call option. And you could actually get an additional 10% monthly on top of it. So now instead of just getting 8% on the, the Juno, now you structure it into a call with a high strike price. And you, now you get 18%. So you, you more than doubled the amount of yield that you got um, through the use of liquid staking tokens and a structured product like a, um, a collateralized uh, uh, um, call option. So this is a little bit more advanced. Uh, I don't know the um, uh, the sophistication of uh, our listeners here on the on the, on this uh, interview. So I do I do want to be respectful of uh, where they are in their finance journey. Uh, but the the nice thing about, is about DeFi and about the interoperability of these products is that people can, once you have the core uh, product available on Cosmos, so then anybody can come and build a more advanced. Or, or really a simplifier where you don't need to think about these strike prices. You don't think you need to think about the expiration dates. Um, somebody can just come and build a vault, which just simplifies or auto, uh, automates a lot of these more complex aspects. 
Okay, several things here. Can you walk through the user story just so it you turn something abstract into something more tangible um, when they first do this? So let, and, and include liquid staking in this paradigm. So sure. I just want to understand that. Sure. Okay. Um, it, it, let's let's talk about just the vanilla product of options uh, and what that looks like. Okay. Um, so the um, the first is uh, I I go to a Juno liquid staking uh, platform and I deposit my Juno tokens. I pick which validator that they're staked to, and now I get back uh, a receipt, which is my liquid staking tokens. Now I have in my wallet a hundred liquid staking Juno tokens that are earning eight percent interest monthly. Okay, now I come and I put those. I take those hundred liquid staking tokens. I deposit them into an option contract. So I'm, I'm, I'm minting a call option and I put a price to that call option. I, I say to myself, you know what? I don't think that right now Juno is about $5. I don't think in the next month it's going to double, but I will sell for the price of, um, of, of, well, what is it? I, this is five hundred dollars worth of tokens um, plus the eight percent that I'll I'll yield on top of that. Um, so the, you know that's another. Wait, sorry, $40. you you cut out you cut out uh, during the percentage. Can you just go back to the the first sure. part? So so now I've got this. Uh, Juno is a is about five dollars a token. So I have a hundred of these tokens. So that's um, that is five hundred uh, you know five hundred dollars worth. And I'm going to get 8% interest on that this month. Um, it might be, yeah, it's about 8% interest. So that's another $40. So really the value of my assets in hand is worth about $540. Um, now I take that and I put it into a, an options contract and I price that at roughly $50. So about 10%. And I say that I will be, and I put a strike price at $8. So I'm essentially saying that I will agree to sell to anyone um, this, uh, this box of tokens, which generates yield and is going to be worth at the end of the month about $540. So for about 50 bucks, I will sell you the right to these hundred, hundred and uh, eight tokens that you will have the option to unlock at the end of the month. And you will have a fixed price that you have to pay for it. Now, if you were to buy that token, if you were to buy this box of uh, this, this call um, option, and let's say Juno goes on a run and it runs to 15 or 16, okay? Now, you are very much in the money. This option that you bought is now um, worth uh, over $1,000. It's worth about $1,100. And you can execute it for the $500 plus the $45 or $50 that you, that you bought it uh, initially. So you made... Um, you doubled your money. You paid $50, but you made at the end of the month, I mean, you didn't even double it because on that $50 that you, that you purchased at the beginning of the month, you were able to redeem that for a profit of $600. So just even though, um, even though Juno only went up, um, you know, it, uh, Juno tripled in price, but you 10 X your profits. And that's the idea of how um, of how people make money on options. But there was really no downside for you because the total amount of loss that you could have been down was only the fifty dollars that you used to spend on the option. So your upside, your downside was risked at fifty dollars, but your upside here was like ten x on your purchase. Understood. So this is why options is so attractive to 
uh, hedge fund managers and people probably more sophisticated in trading, right? Exactly. And and one of our goals is to to simplify it, to, to be able to take a lot of these um, more, both through education, through uh, podcasts like what we're talking about right now, and through um, just simplifying the UI and the UX to make something that's just really easy to for anybody to understand and for anybody to use. You could imagine another scenario where um, you've got a hundred Juno tokens, and you um, just deposit them into a, a vault. And then at the end of the month, you end up with um, 115 Juno tokens. So instead of making 7 to 8% interest, you made 15% interest. And so the options, because it was packaged and because it was sold, um, earned you extra yield than what you would have gotten if those tokens had just sat in your wallet or just sat, um, you know, being delegated to a validator. Okay. So let me just understand this uh, a little bit better. So in this example, you're, you're talking about the seller of the option, right? So yes. Yep. Right. Okay. So simplify it for the seller. And then, uh, and then another way to simplify it for the buyer is to just, um, to have them kind of walk them through a, um, uh, a an educational, uh, almost like a questionnaire as to, okay, what's your strategy? You know, what is it that you would like to, you know, what do you think the price of Juno is going to be in a month? And how much do you want to spend? And then here's how much profit that you would make if you're right. You know, and here's how much you'll lose if you're wrong. And then they can click, go for it, or you know, not going to make it. I don't know what the, the, the meme names of the buttons will be. <laughs> and GMI. That's a good one. So, okay. Is, um, so is the requirement that in order for a token to be eligible for options on Livana, that it needs to have a liquid staked token? No, it's a, a liquid stake token just allows you to double dip. It allows you to get rewards from outside of the platform and then compound them within the platform. But imagine you just had wrapped Bitcoin or wrapped Ethereum and you wanted to mint and sell an option. Sorry, I'm being attacked by sunshine here. Um, imagine you wanted to... Um, uh, you wanted to uh, mint and sell an option so you could actually get yield on Bitcoin, which there is no way to just naturally get yield on Bitcoin. So it's a way to actually create yield on assets that don't have any uh, form of staking. Got it. And what are the assets that are going to be whitelisted, so to speak, in the beginning for options? Uh, so right now we have um, we have some of the basics. We have Atom, uh, we have Juno, we have Osmosis, we have Ethereum, Bitcoin, and so really it'll be up to the community as to what um, you know what assets are going to be uh, added to the platform. Is that through a governance vote, or is that the team deciding? And if it is that the team decides, how is it that you fold these in? Is it through? demand or is there more of a technological barrier to doing that? Um, so we try to minimize um, the, so if, if it's a small enough cap and somebody can um, manipulate the price, so then that um, that's a risk for everyone, you know, especially because they expire. So you really, it's a small window where you'd have to manipulate the price. So that does create some limitation. Um, there will be, um, you know, uh, like initially probably off-chain signaling from the community as what assets that they want, you know, through Discord votes, Commonwealth votes, things like that. But eventually the goal is, is to create a permissionless platform that um, any new market can be launched on. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the intermediary step would be uh, on-chain governance voting to add new markets. Uh, understood. So... Okay. 
speaking of the risks, um, so when you follow Ethereum DeFi closely, uh, I, I noticed a trend, which was um, nothing bad ever happened just at the token level or the staking token level, the, the bad stuff, or at the, at the lending protocol level, like Aave or Compound. Um, the bad stuff happened where there was arbitrage between uh, lenders and flash bots or flash loans and the vaults, like the urine vaults. And I'm speaking specifically about um, uh, people taking positions in a VE curve or something, right? So it, it's just the someone who's really sophisticated is going to come in and be able to uh, attack this daisy chained string of protocols together and um, and arbitrage based on what products are available. Um, I did find that the vaults is where um, most of the risk resided in uh, just because that that's where everyone who um, collateralized their assets in um, lost money. So Yes. I mean, and I think like probably bridges is the number one biggest loss, you know, uh, yeah. just historically. Um, but, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the, uh, it's building compounded, in, uh, interoperable, um, financial tools is hard and incredibly risky. And I think that the, um, the, you know, really what we've seen over the last couple of years is just continuous trial by fire. And that, um, that the manipulators, um, whether it's whales, whether it's, uh, um, you know, flash loans, um, whether it's MEV, uh, can, you know, come in and then, uh, and then kind of like wreck retail or just even wreck institutions. You know, I mean, look, Voyager got wrecked. I mean, you know, Luna like, uh, collapsed. Um, and so it is, um, it's incredibly uh, challenging to build um, and to, to know that it's like a cat and mouse game um, that you are trying to anticipate um, the creativity of a, um, of a, like a destructive force, like a tsunami that's a going to come. Perfect just adversary. Like yeah, exactly. Um, and so it's, I don't think that there's um, a, I don't think that there's a, a surefire way to prevent that. I'll, like, I think that the best that you can do is um, is be transparent um, to have. Uh, Sorry, you, you, know, you cut out on the last part. The best thing that you could do is be what? The best thing that you can do is be humble uh, and transparent uh, about the risks. To be humble and to recognize that you just don't know um, what um, you know what you don't know you don't, you're not as good as the attackers the attackers are always going to be better than you um and so it's a taking an iterative approach um starting with small scale and then growing up uh recognizing that like size it's somebody's always going to have a bigger size than what you you know your 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 biggest size like my biggest like uh, the thing that I didn't anticipate with the crash of uh, Terra is I didn't think that somebody would come with $4 billion and then just like sh short over the course of like a few hours, $4 billion in, you know, in various uh, different settings, like that size was just like shocking to me. And like, but then obviously looking at it in hindsight, it was like, it was, I mean, it was like blatantly obvious. It's like, well, of course somebody was going to do that. Um, so I think that it's just there. There has to be a continuous sense of humility, right? Um, I, actually, I think that uh, the in the principal cost of making that attack, based on the the tweet that 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 uh, I don't know his handle anymore, but um, the guy that warned Do Kwan about it was to the hundreds of millions, not not in the billions. So they were able to um, take advantage of what was it leverage um, in order to kind of kind of make the short? Um, well, there was, I mean, there was an $8 billion movement of UST and there were billions of dollars of, uh, of, um, of Bitcoin. I mean, there was, what was it? It was a 30,000 Bitcoin was, uh, 
was sold trying to to you know to eat up the spot market. So yeah, I meant I meant if, before that, right? Like with the initial spark, the initial cost of um, of uh, of creating the the castigating effect. So I don't know. I I don't know if uh, that's not what I'm familiar with. That it was just a couple hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, I believe that it was a loan. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a loan of around four billion dollars, but it it could be that I'm off by an order of magnitude, and that you're absolutely correct. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that stuff is yeah. A anyway, the the the, the fine. <laughs> so so yeah. I, it, it's hard to build um and and predict these things, right? Just because now everything is becoming more composable. Um, most and of more the complicated as it's, yeah. as the systems get more complicated, um, the attack vectors get harder to anticipate, and uh, and I th I think that um, it's you know it's it's just up to uh, it's uh, you know I think that um, that uh, incentivizing um, bad actors to help make protocols more robust um, is very important. You know, I think like uh, white hat programs um, and uh, catching these types of things when protocols are still small and young and still working with um, relatively, uh, cis, uh, you know, um, palatable uh, amounts of capital, like these types of approaches are, are very important. You know, with most vaults um, that you see even like just within like the DeFi option vault space, um, they they cap themselves at you know whether it's a few million dollars per vault um, or whether it's like a you know a ten or a few tens of millions of dollars per vault and I think that one of the reason that there is this type of uh, of conservative nature um, with vault met, uh, mentality or methodology is the recognition that um, you're kind of like when you create a vault you're kind of like creating a boat and you're putting a lot of people's capital on a boat and then you're sending the boat out. So you, you do want to, um, you don't want to cap the amount that can like just totally sink. You know, you don't want to, you don't want your maiden voyage to be like a Titanic. You want it to be like, you know, a little rubber ducky with like, uh, you know, you know, so like gold coins on the back. Yeah. See, that's the thing. And, and I would take that position too, which is, you know, a lot of these things are experimental and we haven't ironed out all of the bugs yet. So it, it we, we probably shouldn't have it scale to millions of users within a span of six months of it being live. Um, that stuff takes time, right? So I, I think that the Terra experiment just kind of blew up too quickly. And that's because of too many promises and people were... Um, you know, led to falsely believe that this thing was more secure than it was. Uh, it, but so, so I think that the algo stable experiment should have existed just so that um, the, the market understands that that doesn't necessarily work at scale. Right. Um, but, but the incentives were there for people to pile in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I think that uh, the alga stables are inevitable. Uh, I think just the the uh, the 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 benefit. You know, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about uh, you know stables. I've as a researcher, I've done a lot of uh, you know work on in the in the, the stable coin space. Um, but uh, look, you know, custodial banker stable coins um, are only going to end one way, which is. Uh, you know, like uh, central bank coins, um, that's inevitable. And we see that with, you know, the, with what happened with tornado cash and, you know, just kind of blocking and, you know, and then just the kind of infectious like nature and like what's going to happen with curve when, you know, um, and, and various other, uh, you know, pooled things when there's blacklisted and frozen assets. Um, and then the over collateralized maker DAOs of the world are just not capital efficient. Um, so ultimately, everything leads to algorithmic stablecoins, but I think it's probably going to take another half a decade or a decade before there's uh, before the, the the community has um, a, like you know an appetite to be able to take on that type of a risk at scale, and it'll probably not even like look anything like what we you know where things were with um, uh, with Terra or with you know Frax or you know or Olympus or you know. You know 
uh, Ampleforth or any of these other algorithmic stable coins. So it'll probably be something novel and new, and and it will have learned from the previous uh, failures, um, and then thus become stronger. Okay, fair enough. Um, I actually don't think there there is room for stable or alga stables in in the future at scale. Um, small experiments can happen, but but I, I yeah. Maybe you're right, and maybe I'm wrong. Well, I mean, I'm curious. What do you think is going to be the uh, uh, is? I mean, you know, you could throw down the gauntlet and say like, "Well, I'll go to a Bitcoin standard or something like that." But um, but as long as there's like, you know, as long as there's a a global market that's independent, that's like price, you know, that's that, that's at least seemingly price stable over the the course of months or years. You know, I mean. You know, a Snickers bar is a lot smaller than when you and when I was a kid. Um, you know, because of inflation. But uh, so, what is it that you see? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, uh, I think the the only stable asset that I'm familiar with is those 99 cent cans of Arizona iced tea. Um, but apart from that, there, there's really nothing in in the world that's stable. But so, what do you think is the end game in terms of uh, of medium of exchange or um, unit of account within crypto? If it, if from a, a permissionless nature? Is it just we abandon the ideals of permissionlessness? And I know I'm getting off topic, but this is, you know, this is, I'm, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, if I'm to stay philosophically consistent with what I've been proselytizing for the last seven years, it is that the space is going to move closer towards sound money and whatever properties of sound money um, is basically only it's 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 only in in Bitcoin, obviously. So I mean, yep. so so I do I do expect there to be a myriad of stable coins like centralized stable coins or um, you know sort of fracks like collateralized stable coins or over collateralized and algo stables. Um, it's just that over time the more people we uh, onboard into the industry and the greater the market cap of uh, something like Bitcoin, which is which is the driver of this industry, uh, it becomes more stable over time, especially if we're talking about the timeline of 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and it's it's just a good, good medium of exchange and um, store of value and unit of account. Um, but, but uh, or, you know, or it could be that whatever algo stable exists in the future would be uh, solely collateralized by more sound money than than whatever uh, Luna was, and, and not just be built upon oh. something like oh, that. Oh, for sure. And also, yeah, you got to be able to remove the, um, you know, look. I mean, the 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 UST like V two, um, which never really got to be implemented. Um, was designed to um, be redeemable by Bitcoin, so like yeah. that's yeah. So it was it was a frax model. It was very much inspired. And like I've uh, you know I've I've gotten I, I'm very familiar with like you know with like Sam who invented frax and like and and all of his writings and and work and stuff. And and we've got to we we have had an opportunity to work together in the past. And like um, so very impressed with what he's built. And so the idea of building a frax that's really collateralized by Bitcoin um, is, uh, is awesome. And I think that, uh, that, that will exist eventually. Um, and uh, it is, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a great philosophical, um, you know, conversation. And, and I agree that the, that it's inevitable. Bitcoin has two, two futures. It has a future where it is money and we just price things in Bitcoin or it yeah. has a future where it's dead, but, but there's really nowhere in between. So I'm, sure. I'm voting for the money part. It, right, right. And that's that's the whole point of this this industry, I would say. It's it's that once we have sound money and um, sound protocols w without being encumbered by um, overzealous lenders who who kind of just I, I would say it was the lenders that that are responsible for toppling this this market uh, at the scale that it did this time around, uh, you know, because it was the centralized lenders that that promised, you know, 8% year over year on Bitcoin. And uh, that's just not really sustainable as people who 
could not withdraw their Bitcoin by the end of it learned the hard way. Yep. So, you know, if, if we if we keep pushing on this DeFi narrative um, that everything is kind of delta neutral and, and collateralized and tr transparent, um, we would not be in the same position that we were put in in this this bear market summer, bear market winter. Yeah. So that actually brings us, uh, that's a great segue into our second product, which is um, a well-funded Delta neutral uh, perpetual swap. And so we, we actually, um, the, 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 you know, perpetual swaps uh, traditionally have been collateralized by stable coins. And, you know, the most common one is a uh, USDC as a, as a, um, you know, centralized stable coin. And um, what we've done is, is created a notional backed, uh, uh, perpetual that is uh, by by the term well funded. What we mean is that um, that the collateral that is needed in order to create the leverage position becomes locked within the um, the liquidity pool. So you can't have a bank run. You can't have what happened in all these lender positions where just you know people went to redeem and just there was no funds. Like the it so it, it limits the um, the size of growth, but it's a much healthier and, and much safer form that uh, that the, the protocol can never take on more debt than it can actually pay out. Mm -hmm. um, and then not only that, um, is that you can actually fine tune, you can actually, once you take that approach, you can actually calculate the exact cost um, of the upside of various different positions. And then if um, uh, positions take on uh, a, um, a take profit, meaning that they set the, when you open a position, if you set a max gain, so that, uh, that, and that's actually built into the position um, and the collateral that's needed in order to keep it well-funded. So then you can actually significantly reduce the costs to the protocol. And then, then subsequently the, the cost of fees to the end user. Um, uh, so we've built a very unique uh, perpetual swap where you come in, you deposit Bitcoin, or Osmo, or Juno, or Adam, um, whatever it is that you want to get leverage on, and then you pay a borrow fee. You're paying in the notional assets. You're paying in the in Bitcoin for the fee. You you take on a leverage position of your Bitcoin, but then you're actually locking LP um, collateral. So then, if you want 10x, um, so you actually pay. You actually are renting that 10x. And because you're paying a funding rate uh, between the long and the shorts, so then that inspires a delta neutral market, um, which means that the um, liquidity provider um, is taking a roughly delta neutral position uh, within the the market, um, assuming that there's rational actors and uh, you know, and obviously you know, complete meltdown risk over a short period of time, like what happened to Luna, is very hard, if not impossible, to um, you know to prevent against, uh, but. In the vast majority of market conditions, the this economic design um, is uh, it prevents insolvency, which is something that um, that uh, what we saw within kind of like the the CFI space, like you know the the centralized uh, um, you know crypto trading space um, was rampant with insolvency once the market you know passed certain threshold points. And so we've what we've done is created something that's um, far more transparent. Um, and far more robust to prevent those types of uh, meltdowns or insolvency from occurring. Mm -hmm. And and just to walk back a little bit back to fundamentals, can can you talk about perps and futures as what they are? Sure. So uh, perpetual swaps is a it's a contract. Um, it is uh, it doesn't have an expiry date and it has a continuous fee. So whereas options have a one-time fee and an expiration date, perps have a continuous fee. And as long as you're paying that continuous fee, the, um, the, the contract is, is open. So I might um, deposit one Bitcoin, uh, but then I want exposure to 10 Bitcoin. So essentially I'm locking up another nine Bitcoin, but I'm paying a continuous fee in order to have that, um, that, uh, that other nine Bitcoin locked up that fee is being eaten away at the one Bitcoin that I deposited. So technically my leverage is getting higher and higher as I'm paying this continuous fee. And then now if, um, if I'm actually taking the not popular side of the trade, so then the, um, I might actually, it, the, the fee actually might go negative, 
where now I'm actually getting paid to take this long position because so many other people wanted to go short. And the, the platform has a funding rate which is designed to incentivize between long and short positions. And now there's really some, some really interesting delta neutral strategies that you can take where um, if, if everybody wants to go long, then you can actually be delta neutral because you can take a short position with leverage and then you can balance that with just a, a spot position, which is long. So if I've got $10 million of Bitcoin and then, uh, and then I, if, let's say I have 10 Bitcoin that I just bought and is sitting in a ledger somewhere. Um, you know, I'm holding it in cold storage and now I come onto a perps and I take, I put one Bitcoin as a short position, but I do 10 X leverage on it short. So now essentially I'm market neutral, but I might pick up, you know, 30% APR on that. So I actually am going Delta neutral with my Bitcoin. So it's as if I have like a stablecoin position, but it has no, you know, centralized party that, you know, it's that can perform censorship or, um, you know, some other type of nefarious action on it. Um, so I'm, I'm market neutral on the equivalent of, of uh, my 10 Bitcoin, but I'm getting, you know, the, it could be the equivalent of like 15, 20%, like these like DeFi yields, um, which are so enticing, like what Anchor promised. Um, but I, uh, I don't, I've minimized that kind of like blow up risk. Um, I'm not dependent on stable coins and I'm not really dependent on the movement of Bitcoin, of the price of Bitcoin. Okay. So in this paradigm, there's more of a pendulum and trade-off space and more active um, deliberate risk management on the user's part, rather than this idea that you could just um, put UST in and get 20% risk-free. <laughs> yes. Europe. So obviously it has myriads of risks, you know, all kinds of stuff could happen. The platform could get hacked. You know, you could lose your keys. You could send to the wrong address. Um, you could end up your, your short position could get liquidated because of a, you know, a crazy wick. There could be price manipulation. There could be Oracle hacks, but all of those risks are far more transparent than just, oh, buy this coin, it's worth a dollar, and then you'll get 20% yield on it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay, that's, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, is, is there, um, what, well, yeah, it, it is, so going back to how, you discussed at the very beginning of this interview how the options and futures uh, kind of kind of uh, complement each other. Um, how does how does the user kind of uh, play with that? Well, let's say for example that you um, had a covered call, meaning it was a call where I mean in, in DeFi in, or in the traditional finance space, you can have uh, you can have calls that are just kind of like you know gentlemanly handshakes like i will sell you an option that says that at a later date you can buy stock from me i don't even own the stock today you know or it could not even be stock it could be the option to buy land or to buy soybeans um whatever it is so in in uh in crypto everything is uh is covered meaning that it's kind of like it's a it's a smart contract is a box that actually has the tokens inside of it and then the who's allowed to unlock that box um, you know, is determined by, you know, various nuance of the, the strike price, the expiry date and, and various oracles. So I might um, take, I might want the yield that like, let's say I can get 10% on a covered call. So I want to take that as a, a market neutral position or a delta neutral position. So I might put a million dollars into a covered call and then I take a million dollars of the equivalent short position. So now I'm market new, uh, using perps um, you know, similar to the example that I gave with the Bitcoin on a ledger. And so now I'm making money. Um, now I'm making money from two ends. Um, you know, the everybody's bullish. So the longs are paying the shorts on perps. So I'm getting a funding rate there. And the covered call is earning in, is earning uh, um, fees, you know, just for the, the month that it's, uh, that it's open. So I can get paid for the perps. I can get paid for the, 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 the call, but I'm still market neutral. Got it. Cool. So, um, just some of the last house housekeeping things. When when is this going to be live? Um, you know, when are your NFTs going to be live? What are the some of the dates that people should be activated around? 
Well, so the NFTs are uh, are uh, were uh, uh, have been minted throughout the last twelve months. Um, they're available on Juno. So Juno has a, um, a an NFT marketplace that just launched, which is called Loop. So it's still in beta, uh, but they're rolling out uh, new features like collections and searches, and you know, and uh, and history and things like that um, over the next uh, you know weeks and months. So, but they are live today. Um, and uh, if you're interested in reading this, the story, you know, we've got a summary of the story on our blog, blog.lavana.finance. You know, we've got, uh, we have the audio book, which uh, you can find on our Discord in the lore section. And um, then um, the uh, options is, has been on Testnet on Juno for the last month. Uh, Perps goes live on Testnet um, next week. And then from... Uh, you know, both of them were kind of doing a like product market fit usability study. So if you want to participate in that, just, uh, you know, raise, you know, raise a flag on Discord um, and we'll have somebody from, uh, you know, the, the core team um, or core contributors, uh, you know, reach out to you and, and do a usability uh, uh, session. And then um, the, you know, the target date is to have the token launch, um, well, to have uh, both the options and perps live. Um, by the end of the year uh, on mainnet and hopefully a lot before that. Um, and then the token launch to be, uh, you know, at the beginning of next year. Cool. Well, very exciting. Thank you, Jonathan, for coming on this show. And uh, before we log off, can we say hi to your little sidekick there? Sure. So this is, uh, so I have an, I have an aviary outside. So this is, uh, this is sunshine. He's not being very social right now. Uh, I wish I had a treat for him. So he's uh, he's tired. It's past his bedtime. But so he is a he is a fisher parrot, which is a type of lovebird from uh, Tanz T Tanzania, I believe. Um, so his uh, he was born in my backyard, um, and his uh, his parents flew away uh, when I I believe one of my one of my uh, children's you know one of the neighbor kids uh, didn't close the door to the aviary. Um, and so his mom actually returned back, uh, you know, a, uh, a couple weeks later. So she's living outside, but he was raised inside. Um, and he's, uh, he is, um, you know, he's a little shy. Um, and I'm trying to, to, to reintroduce him to a more natural habitat. Um, but he gets pretty upset at night. So he's still sleeping inside at night. And you can see he's, uh, he's pretty clingy. Um, so he, uh, tends to, to to hang out and he really likes video calls. So whenever he sees me sitting in front of the computer, uh, he cries to participate. <laughs> That's so cute. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for this interview. It's been very insightful. And I look forward to having more sophisticated instruments to trade in the Cosmos ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, it was, you had some great questions. So I enjoy watching the interview after uh, after it goes live. Yep, absolutely. Well, all right. Bye, everyone. All right, take